So on to inner product spaces. So we've talked vector spaces effectively. Now we're gonna put an inner product like a dot product on vector spaces. And it's this section in which we'll finally define formally what a Hilbert space is. So in this section, we introduce inner products on vector spaces and we'll get a lot of the geometry of Rn in these more general settings. We'll have to make some restrictions to create an infinite dimensional space that really has all the geometry of Rn. It'll lack some topological properties. We'll see some heine borel violation in an infinite dimensional vector space, uh, but we're gonna strive for carrying the geometry of Rn over into an infinite dimensional setting. We know if you have an n-dimensional vector space whose scalars are real, then up to isomorphism, you have the vector space Rn. And we could replace that with a arbitrary scalar field F and you would have structurally up to isomorphism, the vector space Fn, fundamental theorem of finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, so uh, next we'll formally define an inner product a uh, vector space with complex scalars. So I will assume complex scalars. The inner product is complex valued as well. So that will have some implications. Some implications we can rewire to deal with the case for real scalars. But an inner product space, also called a Euclidean space or a pre-Hilbert space, I prefer inner product space. Uh, is a such a vector space where there's a function denoted with these angle brackets that maps pairs of vectors into the complex numbers such that for any vectors u, v, and w and any scalar a, we require the following. The inner product of vector v with itself is real and non-negative. And the only time the inner product of a vector with itself is zero is if we're dealing with a zero vector. This property looks reminiscent of some properties of a norm and we'll use, of course, the inner product to induce a norm. And that's the predominant topic of this section. We're requiring that if we have the inner product of U with the sum V plus W, that equals the inner product of U with V plus the inner product of U with W. So there's um, kind of half of a linearity behavior with respect to addition in this second position. The inner product of u with scalar a times vector v is required to equal scalar a times the inner product of u and v. There's the other half of linearity with respect to the second position. And we require that the inner product of u and v be the complex conjugate of the inner product of v with u. Remember, we're getting out complex numbers for these inner products. So conjugation, is an appropriate manipulation of inner products. And we don't get a precise symmetry, we get sort of a conjugate symmetry uh, with respect to complex valued inner products. The function's called an inner product and the whole thing together, the vector space with the inner product is called an inner product space. Now we can combine some of these properties, speaking of linearity, uh, we could take the inner product of u with a linear combination, a, v plus w. We can break that up over the vector addition, and then we can bring those scalars out of the first position. So we do have linearity in the second position. If we try to deal with a linear combination in the first position, here's what we do. Let's take a conjugate swap things around, get that linear combination in the second position, but that introduced a complex conjugate, use the linearity in the second position, and then swap everything back. What that amounts to is you pick up a conjugation on those scalars A and B. So scalars A and B come out of the first position with conjugates on them. Otherwise we do have uh, the half of linearity related to vector sums. So we can certainly split up over the first entry, uh, split things up over vector addition, but scalars come out with conjugates on them. It's said to be conjugate linear in the first position. A uh, word of warning, 
um, this isn't universal. Sometimes it's done the other way around where we have linearity in the first position and conjugate linearity in the second position. That doesn't affect any of the structure. It affects some computations and some definitions we'll have to have. You just move the conjugate around, uh, but beware of that. Um, in the physics world, uh, they possibly do it this way or possibly they do it the other way. It seems physics did it um, different from the standard math way. Uh, but I will refer to some notes from Fundamentals of Functional Analysis, for which I use these particular notes as a supplement. And uh, even there, we've got it defined slightly differently. So beware of your context, which book you're using as to whether you have linearity in the first or second position and conjugate linearity in the second or the first position. So beware of that. This is not a universally accepted way of approaching it, but it's easily adapted from one definition to the other. If we wanted to deal with real scalars and have a real valued inner product, uh, we could simply replace property D, <clears throat> which gave us that introduction of a conjugate. Well, if, if these are real numbers, then the conjugation doesn't do anything. Conjugation changes the sign of the imaginary part. And if they're real numbers, the imaginary part is zero. So there's no change if we have a mapping into the real numbers. So if we had real scalars and real valued inner products, we'd simply get that the inner product of u and v equals the inner product of v and u in order. So there's a symmetry to the um, <clears throat> inner product relationship in the real setting, but there is not in the complex setting. And this is behaving just like dot products. Uh, Rn from sophomore linear algebra with the usual dot product from sophomore linear algebra, that's an example of a, a real inner product space. If you happen to deal with scalar, uh, with complex scalars in sophomore linear algebra, then you would have had to modify things a little bit. Speaking of, and here's an example, the vector space Cn is an inner product space with the inner product defined for vector u with these components and vector v with these components as the inner product of u and v is the sum j equals one to n, u sub j conjugate times v sub j, u sub j conjugate times v sub j. You just multiply those together in the real setting, in the, um, in the complex setting, you need the conjugation. And indeed, having the conjugate on the first one will produce that conjugate linearity in the first component that we were talking about. So order matters, be very careful. If you happen to have a situation where you're dealing with conjugate linearity in the second position, then you'd have to move that conjugate from the u sub j's to the v sub j's, as is done in other settings. All right, for uh, an inner product space with the usual notation for the inner product, <clears throat> define the norm induced by the inner product as the norm of vector v as the inner product of v with itself, square root of. How dare we call that a norm? Norms have to <clears throat> satisfy certain properties, so we'll go through and establish the, the definition of norm uh, and, and show that this indeed <clears throat> does satisfy that definition and so is a norm. <clears throat> Quick comment, with inner products, the inner product of a vector with itself was non-negative, a non-negative real number. So all the square root stuff, that's fine. You're taking square roots of non-negative real numbers these norms are all real numbers themselves. Oh, they're all non-negative real numbers. Remember, square roots of real numbers are never negative. It's the, just the meaning of the square root function. The square root function presents you with a non-negative square root. If you want the negative square root, you have to ask for the negative square root by inserting negative signs. But we're getting out um, non-negative real value. That's part of the definition of a norm. It's very straightforward to confirm that for any A in the scalar field, the real or the complexes, then we have the norm of A times V equals the absolute value of A times the norm of V. We 
put an A here, we'd pick up an A in the first and second uh, positions in that inner product. <coughs> the A would come out of the second position as an A, would come out of the first position as an A conjugate. We'd have A conjugate times A, square root of, and that's where the absolute value of A would come from, or the modulus of A in the event that A is complex. So the, this property of norms satisfied easily. Uh, we might also observe, and maybe we'll do this here shortly, um, the only time this norm is going to be zero is when you put in the zero vector as well. That will follow from part of the definition of inner product. Of course, the tricky part is uh, the triangle inequality. So we'll go through, as you always do, Schwartz's inequality whenever establishing the triangle inequality in a vector space. <coughs> you always have Schwartz's inequality. Now, the nature of the proof of Schwartz's inequality may depend on how complicated your vector spaces are. In uh, sophomore linear algebra, they were just, uh, were just Rn. Here, uh, we're dealing with inner product spaces, so not necessarily Rn. Rn forms an example of an inner product space. Cn gives us examples of inner product spaces. But all the equipment we got to work with is the equipment that we're dealing with an inner product space. So all we really have is a definition of inner product and vector manipulations. The claim for Schwartz's inequality is the modulus of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. In sophomore linear algebra, the conclusion probably reads almost exactly like that. It's common to use little dots. You have u vector dot the v vector, probably in sophomore linear algebra, but it means the same thing as the inner product. In sophomore linear algebra, you're dealing with um, Rn, I suspect. And you may deal with this more abstract vector space setting and more abstract inner products. Uh, it's sometimes covered in sophomore linear algebra. No reason not to. It's, it's not more, much more complicated than dealing with Rn. So let's go through a proof of that uh, one more time. Why? Because we're going to use Schwartz's inequality to prove the triangle inequality. And then we can backtrack and say, told you so, that really is a norm. So we will have established that this quantity thusly defined satisfies the definition of a norm. And then we were justified in calling it a norm. So that's the reason for Schwartz's inequality. That's always the reason for Schwartz's inequality is to prove the triangle inequality. So uh, proof, actually fairly simple proof. Okay, let's look at um, the norm of u plus a v, where a is a scalar, u and v are as given, uh, sorry, norm squared. Because I said so, that's why. Uh, we'll do some, some clever, though granted uninspired at this stage. We'll do some clever but uninspired manipulations, and that'll lead us to uh, the conclusion of the Schwartz's inequality. So consider the norm squared of vector u plus scalar a times vector v. By the definition of these symbols, norm, we would get the inner product of u plus a v with itself. Actually, that gives the norm squared. We would take a square root of that to get the norm, but we're dealing with the norm squared, so this is the correct quantity. The inner product of any vector with itself is non-negative, part of the definition of inner product, so we have that satisfied. This will hold for any scalar, so in particular, this inequality holds if we take A to be the scalar, uh, B, where B is any real number, uh, times the conjugate of the inner product of U and V divided by the modulus of the inner product of U and V. A uh, quick comment, if, uh, if the inner product of U and V is zero, then we got a problem, so we can't do this. Yeah, well, if the, uh, inner product of u and v is zero, then the result trivially holds. We get zero is less than or equal to this product of, of norms, and you know these to be non-negative. So the result will hold in that event, and without loss of generality, we can assume the inner product of u and v is non-zero. So 
can't argue with this. This situation here holds for any A, a scalar. In particular, let's take this scalar. We're saying B is real. We're not saying A is real, right? We've got some complex stuff going on in the numerator here. So A itself could, could be a complex number. It's okay. Set up here, it's an arbitrary complex number. All right, so then if we look at this inner product of the vector u plus a v with itself, if we'll expand that out using the linearity properties, then we will get the inner product of u with itself. In other words, the norm squared of u. We'll get the inner product of a v with itself. In other words, we'll get the norm of a v squared. The a can come outside with a conjugate. We've got a square on that. And using the linearity and the conjugate linearity, this will produce a times the inner product of u and v plus uh, the conjugate of a times the inner product of u and v. Follow the linearity and the conjugate linearity, and it's a straightforward computation to, pr to produce this. All right, we were saying this inequality holds for this particular value of a. So we're going to plug this in for a. So we'll pick up this here, there it is, here, uh, there it is, and here. All right, one observation pertinent to this last part. Hey, the, um, the modulus of A would be the modulus of this quantity, but the numerator and denominator are complex conjugates of each other, and so they have the same magnitude as complex numbers. So uh, we get out the modulus of A and the modulus of B are equal, the last manipulation. Uh, did, we, uh, did we really conjugate properly when we did this substitution? So we need to conjugate this whole thing. Well, B is real, so conjugation doesn't affect it. The denominator is real, so conjugation doesn't affect it. And we need to conjugate the conjugate, giving us just the inner product of U and V. And indeed, that's, a, that's what we've done to get this. So this really is a conjugate. Of course, we've got the conjugate of u and v over here, as we should. The conjugate of a product is the product of the conjugates, probably day one in a complex variables course. Mm. All right. A um, couple of ways to approach this. How about this? We've got a complex number and it's conjugate multiplied together. In fact, we've got that in two places. When you take this complex number conjugated, multiply it by the complex number itself, you get the modulus of that complex number. So the inner product of u and v conjugate times the inner product of u and v, that's the modulus squared of the inner product of u and v. So this produces a modulus squared of the inner product of u and v. We've got a modulus of that quantity in the denominator. We can cancel and simplify, and you're simply left with modulus of inner product of u and v in the numerator. Same thing happens over here. So we got two of those. So we have two times B times the modulus of the inner product of U and V. Uh, otherwise, we've just copied. Remember, we're computing an inner product of a vector with itself, and we know that to be non-negative. So we have produced this. And remember, B can be any real number. So we've introduced an inequality, uh, really granted, unmotivated as to why we're doing this, but hey, we got an inequality and Schwartz's inequality is an inequality. So we got that going for us. Uh, also, we're looking for relationships that involve norms of U and norms of V. Okay, we got some norms of U and some norms of V and involves the modulus of the inner product of U and V. And there that is right there. So this is potentially relevant. So let's call this equation one. Next, we're going to take this left-hand side. Remember, it's greater than or equal to zero. That's equation one. But we're going to take this left-hand side and treat it as a function of B. Remember, B is real. Other than that, there were no, no restrictions on parameter B. So consider the function of B, F of B, which is the left-hand side of what we had above. And we know this to be greater than or equal to zero. As a function of B, we have um, norm of u squared. That's uh, 
the oh, it's positive, 2b times some constant, uh, real dealing with a real number here, plus b squared times some other constant. Treating this as a function of b, look at this. We have a concave up parabola were we to graph this, second degree polynomial, unless the norm of v is zero, in which case the inner product is zero and the, the Schwartz inequality holds trivially. Uh, so some observations are relevant on that, but barring the fact that the norm of V is zero, then we have a legitimate second degree polynomial. When you graph it, what's it look like? Well, depending on parameter B, uh, might look something like this and um, be an opening upward parabola that's always positive. The vertex might actually touch the B axis down here. So the input, the output would be zero, in which case we get that quantity to be greater than or equal to zero versus stri strictly greater than in the blue situation. And over here, we get that quantity, that function F of B to be positive sometimes, negative sometimes, and positive other times. Remember, equation one from the previous slide said this is non-negative. Okay, well then this, this red one, warning, that can't be the case because we know from the previous slide that f of b is non-negative. So how are you going to take this picture and translate it into the property? Uh, well, use the fact that this can't happen. What algebra, algebraic manipulations shall we do to show this can't happen? Well, here's the idea. This forbidden red graph, where we have sometimes positive, sometimes negative, can't be the case. This is non-negative. This happens when we get two zeros of this function. So there's two places where the parabola crosses the axis. Uh, one point where it touches the axis, not a problem. When we get equals zero, we don't get negative. It's the negative that's a problem. Um, no, uh, no zeros for this function not a problem. It opens upward, so it must be above the axis and always be positive. It's this, it's this that's the problem. Now we have a quadratic in B, so let's apply the quadratic equation. We're trying to eliminate the case where this has two roots. That's a problem. That contradicts equation one. If this quadratic in B has two roots and there's pictures to illustrate it. So to ensure that one holds and that the function f of b is non-negative, we'll solve for b in the equality f of b equals zero. We don't want this to happen, but at a single point. Well, a quadratic equation tells you that B equals, uh, going through substituting in the, the two modulus of inner product of U and V, uh, the leading, um, let's see, what is it? Uh, negative B, so to speak, plus or minus the square root of this squared, B squared, as it were, but B is representing something totally different here. Minus four AC in the, in the terminology of the quadratic equation produces this. All right. Um, but because of the plus or minus stuff, we're going to get two solutions unless this is zero. If this is zero, we're okay. We'll only get one solution. It'll be that middle picture from the previous slide. Um, if this is positive, we got a problem. It'll be that right hand picture on the middle side. If this is positive, we'll get two solutions B where the function equals zero. If this determinant is non-positive, then we're okay. If it's negative, we don't get any real solutions. Remember B was a real number. We went out of our way to deal with that. So inspired by, let's go back to the picture. Inspired by the fact we don't want this to happen. We need that discriminant to be non-positive. If it's positive, then we'll get two solutions to the equation F of B equals zero. And we'll have places where the quantity f of b is negative, and that can't happen. That's what we had in condition one. Okay, uh, so 
to have inequality one hold for all U and V. We need the discriminant, the stuff under the radical. It's maybe been a while since you've used that verbiage, but we need that thing to be non-positive. That is, we need it to be less than or equal to zero. Equals zero gives us one solution, we're good. Less than zero gives us no solutions. We're also good, picture on the left. And this will take the, um, the moduli of the V's and the U's, take it to the right-hand side, take a square root and simplify, and that produces exactly the Schwartz inequality. Okay, so um, there's an argument for it. Not particularly geometric and mostly algebraic. I mean, I did look at the graph of a parabola uh, and extract some information for it. There's a number of other proofs of Schwartz's inequality. Uh, this is probably the easiest one though. Granted, it's a little unmotivated because we started by looking at the inner product of, uh, what was it, U plus AV with itself. And then we manipulated things and tricked that into giving us the answer. So arguably not too well motivated, but it works. And there's other approaches. This is the easy approach though, though it does involve a little bit of magic, Un, um, unmotivated manipulations, I should say, and clever choices of constants. Why did we choose A to be that particular value? Because <laughs> it worked in hindsight. Back to the notes. All right, so Schwartz's inequality is established. Why would we do this? So we can prove the triangle inequality that says uh, for all U and V in this inner product space, we have the norm of U plus V less than or equal to the norm of U plus the norm of V. These norms, sorry, alleged norms being produced, induced by the inner product in the definition we had above when I was complaining about calling it a norm. Well, I'm justified in calling it a norm, but after we establish a triangle inequality. So let's do that. That's the whole reason that we did Schwartz's inequality. And it's just a straightforward computation. You have seen this before because you do it in sophomore linear algebra and, and probably other places it might pop up in applied math. All right, we'll take the inner product of uh, excuse me, we'll take the alleged norm squared of u plus v, which is defined as the inner product of u plus v with itself. Using the linearity and conjugate linearity, no scalars, so no, no concerns over the conjugate stuff, but that will produce this inner product of u with itself, inner product of v with itself, inner product of u with v, and inner product of v with u. Uh, <clears throat> if this was real, these would be equal to each other. We'd have that symmetry and we could uh, approach this slightly differently. But here we've got inner product of U with V. Let's see, that comes with this and that, and an inner product of V with U, which comes from these two. I mean, you basically foil it. Um, since there's no scalars, <clears throat> that's effectively what, what happens in terms of the, the linearity properties. Hey, the inner product of U with itself, that's the norm of U squared. The inner product of V with itself, Hey, that's the norm of V squared. We used some of this in the last result. And there you are stuck with a, like a backwards one. Well, let's flip it around, but you'll have to introduce a conjugate by the properties of inner products. So the inner product of V with U becomes the conjugate of the inner product with U and V. Here we have a complex number plus its conjugate. All we've done is change the sign of the imaginary part, <laughs> add these two together, the imaginary part disappears and you're left with two copies of the real part. So, summing these produces twice the real part of the inner product. We can get one more step with fairly elementary knowledge. <clears throat> the real part of a complex number is always less than or equal to the modulus of the complex number. The imaginary part satisfies the same condition, but the real part is less than or equal to the modulus of a complex number. Something you probably also do really early on in complex variables when you encounter some properties of complex numbers. You might even do this in, in pre-calculus, depending on how much time you spend on complex numbers. It's not, it's not out of the realm of possibility. And now we're stuck using elementary information. All we've used to get down here is um, 
definition of this alleged norm in terms of inner products, properties of inner products and properties of complex numbers. So we get stuck there. Fortunately, we've already done the Schwartz's inequality, which tells us that the modulus of the inner product of u and v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. So introduce an inequality, pick up this quantity, why that's a perfect square. That is norm of u plus norm of v quantity squared, foil that out, it's legitimate foil this time. You get the first one squared plus twice the product plus the last one squared, which is exactly the previous thing. So we have norm of u plus v quantity squared, less than or equal to norm of u plus norm of v quantity squared, take square roots of both sides, square root functions an increasing function, and that produces the triangle inequality. Triangle inequality, very, very straightforward. Proof always goes something like this. Um, you may not have complex scalars, but you always expand out, <clears throat> introduce this absolute value or modulus somehow or other, depending on real or complex scalars, and then your Schwartz's inequality, get a perfect square, take a square root. That's always the proof of the triangle inequality. Uh, whoops, back to the notes first. All right, so we've looked at vector spaces in the previous section, uh, normed vector spaces in the previous section as well, and inner product spaces. So you see that an inner product space has a norm on it. You can use the inner product to define a norm. So any inner product space is an example of a normed vector space. So we get this hierarchy. Uh, on the big side, there's just all these vector spaces. Some of them have norms, some of them don't. Of normed vector spaces, some of those vector spaces have norms induced by inner products, and some of them don't. So we get this level of inclusion. Um, so the most special we could get in the conversation so far is inner product spaces. You get more and more structure. I mean, think in a vector space, I don't know, maybe you can't even talk about the magnitude of a vector, but you can in a norm vector space. But even in a norm vector space, maybe you can't talk about angles between vectors. You need an inner product to do that, like dot product is used in sophomore linear algebra. Speaking of, one particular angle we're interested in is right angles. Two vectors u and v in an inner product space are said to be orthogonal if their inner product is zero. Just like in Rn where the dot product is zero implies perpendicular vectors. A set of vectors, v1, v2, and so forth, notice it's an infinite set of vectors. That's maybe a new thing from sophomore linear algebra. But this set of vectors is said to be orthogonal if the inner product of any two different of those vectors equals zero. The inner product of v sub i with v sub j is zero, provided i and j are different. That same set of vectors is said to be orthonormal if pairwise we have distinct vectors being orthogonal. And if we take the inner product of a vector with itself, v sub i with v sub i, that gives us the norm squared of v sub i by the definition of the norm induced by the inner product, if that equals one. That is if all these are unit vectors. So if we have an orthogonal set of unit vectors, it's called an orthonormal set. In this case, the vectors having length one are said to be normalized. Uh, I can, with an eye towards taking linear combinations, I can always scale vectors and that won't, that won't affect the span of a set. So I can always take a set of vectors and make them all unit vectors, unless there's a zero vector in there. All right, uh, now we can prove something we will refer to as the Pythagorean theorem. Let's read it, make an observation about it, and then look at the proof. It says, let V1 through V sub n be an orthonormal set of vectors in an inner product space. For all vectors in this inner product space, we have the following. So we're going to relate vector u to this set of orthonormal vectors. The norm squared of u equals the sum from j equals 1 to n of the inner product of u with v sub j modulus of squared plus the square of the norm of u minus this stuff 
the inner product of uh, v sub j with u. So we reverse those for some reason uh, times v sub j. So what we've done is really taken vector u and written it in two components. And these two components are perpendicular. That's where the Pythagorean theorem title comes in. And ultimately, as we go through the proof, you'll see, we're dealing with the norm of u squared equals the norm of v squared plus the norm of w squared, where this is related to vector v and this is related to, well, this, this is vector w, this is the norm of vector v, that's what we'll see in the proof. So it really does look very Pythagorean theorem-ish. That's the reason it's called that. Uh, Pythagorean theorem deals with right triangles. It must have something to do with the orthogonality, or the, the orthonormal set stuff. It must be vector u and vector v are orthogonal. Let's look at a proof. Pythagorean theorem, here's what it says. Uh, I don't see all that geometry in the statement of it, but we'll see it developed. First off, we can trivially say that vector u equals this linear combination plus vector u minus this linear combination because this and this cancels on the right-hand side just leaving us with vector u. So you can't argue with that. Now, it turns out, we'll see later on, this is a fundamental decomposition of u um, to let the story out now. This is the projection of vector u onto the span of this set of vectors. And this is what's left. So we're projecting onto this subspace, the space spanned by these vectors. And then we're taking the remainder of vector u. So we've breaking vector u into two components. I might call this one, um, we call it v and w, I think is what we called them before, if I've got the order correct. And we'll see that these two vectors are in fact orthogonal. So we can certainly write u like that. Let's take exactly that. Let's take an inner product of those two vectors, what I've been calling V and W. So we're taking the inner product of this sum with U minus that sum. Let's go back. Yeah, we're taking the inner product of this with the inner product of this. Take the inner product of those. Okay, there's summations all over the place, but uh, hey, we got linearity and conjugate linearity of the inner product. So we can handle this. First, we'll break it up over that negative sign in the second component, right? There's the, there's the comma, here's the second component. We're breaking this up over that negative sign. The U goes there, the summation goes there, and the first component stays the same. All right. Um, here, we're taking an inner product. We've got summation in the first position, well, we got linearity in the first position, excuse me, we got conjugate linearity in the first position. So this sum in the first position, inner product with u, can be dealt with as follows. We can deal with the summation stuff, take the inner product inside the summation, if I were to insert all the intermediate steps, then bring the constants, the scalars, the v sub j u inner product, bring that outside of that first component, whoops, but coming out of the first component, it brings with it a conjugate. That's the conjugate linearity. So what we've done here is use conjugate linearity, break up the inner product of a sum as the sum of the inner products and get the scalars outside of that first position in the inner product. Remember, this is just some complex scalar, comes out of that first position with a conjugate on it. We have conjugate linearity in the first position. And let's see, let's make a slight little change here. So what we've done is broken this up also over the first component, but only the vector addition part, All right? So we've taken the summation outside. You can take vector sums outside of the first or the second position as far as that goes. No concerns over conjugates. Just with the summation stuff, that's just vector sums. So we brought this summation outside and we've changed this from a sum from j equals one to n to a sum from k equals one to n. We've got our reasons. So we've simply uh, changed the dummy variables there. So we haven't really changed anything uh, algebraically, but put some symbols. Okay, next, uh, let's see, we left that alone this time, right. Uh, now 
let's break this up using linearity in the second term. So we can bring this summation from k equals one to n, bring that out of the inner product. And be careful, you got inner products inside inner products. And that's where we were led. That's the reason we change from j's to k's to make this unambiguous. Next, we can bring this coefficient, this complex scalar, out. It will come out with a conjugate on it. Bring it outside of that inner product. There it is. V sub j, inner product with u, conjugate of. First position comes out as a conjugate. V sub k, inner product with u. Second position, also a scalar. It comes out of that inner product without a conjugate. So we brought this out of the first position, brings a conjugate with it. We brought this out of the second position, just comes out linearity in the second position. That produces this. All right, uh, here we have a complex number times its conjugate. That's the modulus squared of that complex number. So we can write this as the modulus squared of the inner product. Uh, over here, let's see. Remember those V's formed an orthonormal set, the V sub I's? So this inner product is zero unless J equals K. Excuse me, this inner product is zero unless K equals J. Let's look at it from that perspective. So we get zero, 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 one at the point when K equals J. We're gonna sum from one to N with a K parameter. So we get a zero here, except for that one time when K equals J, in which case we'll get a V sub J, V sub J. Well, that's the inner product of one of those orthonormal vectors with itself. That's when we get a one. So we're gonna get zero, 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 one, zero, 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 as K ranges from one to N. The one coming when K equals J. So when k equals j, we keep this stuff. This is a one. When k doesn't equal j, we lose all this stuff because this inner product is zero because we have an orthonormal set of vectors. So that'll produce um, when k equals j, we'll have this, this unaffected uh, v sub j inner product with u. So what we'll have, the only time we don't have a zero term is the inner product of v sub j with u conjugate times the inner product of V sub J with U. A complex number times its conjugate is the modulus squared of that complex number. So that produces this. All right, uh, those are the same. The indices have been manipulated with this in mind. So we've got a uh, sum from J equals one to N of this stuff minus a sum from J equals one to N of the same stuff. Okay, well, that, that's just zero. That's a number minus, minus itself. We have just shown that the inner product of this vector with that vector is zero. That means this vector and that vector are orthogonal. Okay, so these two vectors are orthogonal, this one and this one. So let's look at the norm of u squared. We started this by saying, trivially, we can write u in this form, right? It's some stuff plus u minus the same stuff. So write u in this form, take an inner product of u with itself. Here's one u, there's the comma, there's the second u, there's the closure on the inner product bracket. So in this display style, it takes lots of space. But all we've done is, simpl is simply replace u with this expression of u. All right, let's use linearity and conjugate linearity. <clears throat> so we can break this up. Um, let's see, we'll have the inner product of the first with the first, inner product of the firsts we'll have inner product of the last with the last, inner product of the last with the last. Then we'll have the inner product of this one with that one, plus the inner product of that one with this one. But we just showed on the previous slide, the stuff in the big parentheses here is perpendicular to this stuff. So when we take an inner product of this with that, we get zero. When we take an inner product of that with this, we get a zero. So if you think in terms of FOIL, there's some validity to that. The 
the inner terms, they disappear. And we're just left with the inner product of these two with each other and the inner product with these two with each other, because this stuff is perpendicular to, to say that stuff. So we lost some terms. We just kept the outermost and uh, I guess the first and the last in the foil terminology. And uh, inner product of this with itself, uh, we can um, bring those scalars, uh, the, let's see, what do we do here? Hmm. Hmm. V sub j with itself, let's see. Oh, uh, we get the norm. <laughs> This is a inner product of the same thing. So we get the norm squared of this vector. Same thing here, inner product of this stuff with itself. We get the norm squared of this vector, which is explicitly written for the second one down here. We get the norm squared of this. And by the way, this is what we were looking for. In the first term, we get the norm squared of this vector. Oh, but remember the, um, the V sub J's were orthonormal. So when we go through all this linear combination stuff, you're going to lose a bunch of stuff. The only time we're going to get the same things out in this inner product stuff is when this index is the same as that index. Um, J ranges from one to N in both of these. So don't confuse it and say, well, they're already the same. Well, remember the J changes in both of them. Might not be a bad idea to convert this one into a K equals one to N and put a K here and there but the orthonormality will produce loads of zeros. The only thing we end up keeping is an inner product of V sub J U with, inner, with uh, the V sub J U conjugate, uh, those get together as scalars and produce this, similar to what we did in the past. And that's what we wanted to show. And that, they say, is the Pythagorean theorem. So we've got a vector squared equals um, excuse me, the norm squared of a vector equals the norm squared of a vector. It's, it's this vector right here, plus the norm squared of another vector. And we showed on the previous slide, this vector and this vector are perpendicular. Call this vector V, call this vector W. We've shown that the norm of U squared equals the norm of V squared plus the norm of W squared, where V and W are orthogonal and V plus W equals U. That's your Pythagorean theorem part of it. So that's a clunky version of the Pythagorean theorem, but it really is just the Pythagorean theorem dealing with taking a vector and decomposing it in a special way. We'll give some more meaning to these V's and W's later as kind of foreshadowed already. Uh, the fact that the Pythagorean theorem holds means uh, from a a differential geometry perspective that these are these are flat spaces. If you have Euclidean geometry, you have a flat space. So all these inner product spaces are flat in a sense. I mean, we're not going to go into curvature. We got enough on our plate, but these are accurate statements. It's flat because the way the norm behaves, or if you like the way the metric behaves. These things have a Euclidean metric on them, and the Euclidean part of Euclidean metric means flat. Euclid studies flat uh, spaces. You want to study curved spaces, then uh, this ain't quite the place to do it. You need to introduce manifolds, and manifolds can be introduced using Hilbert spaces, it turns out. Uh, but anyhow, these are flat spaces because of the way we measure distance. We measure it with a norm that satisfies the Pythagorean theorem. You got the Pythagorean theorem, you got a flat space. Uh, another little result, uh, rather similar to what we had above, uh, says let V1 through V sub N be an orthonormal set in an inner product space. Then for any vector U, we have norm squared of U is greater than or equal to the sum of these inner products. Whoops, a little, little error there. I should have angle brackets for those inner products and not uh, parentheses. I will get that fixed in the online notes. Uh, called Bessel's inequality. Yeah, that's just, uh, that's the Pythagorean theorem with this part dropped off. Right? We had an equality here. This thing is non-negative and drop it off. You pick up a greater than or equal to. So that's the reason Bessel's inequality holds. 
sorry about the bad notation on inner products and probably seeped in from from sophomore linear algebra. So I should have the angle brackets there, uh, but that will be updated on the online notes, the minor little thing. Now, we can define a metric then on an inner product space using the norm. We'll say the distance from vector u to vector v is the norm of the difference. This is a metric. And if we have a metric, then we can do all sorts of analysis stuff. So on a um, linear space, if you have a norm, then you have a metric. And I don't need an inner product to get a metric. I just need a norm. Well, I want to be able to measure distance for sure. I want to do more than that. I want to talk orthogonality. And for that, we need an inner product. And we want to talk projections. And for that, we need an inner product. But <clears throat> if you have a norm, then you have a metric. And if you have a metric, then you can do analysis. So with a metric, we can define open and closed sets using the metric. We can define Cauchy sequences using the metric. We can define limits using the metric. We can define continuity of appropriate functions using metrics. We can do analysis if we have a metric. So the metric has to be dealt with and we got it as long as we have a norm. <clears throat> we actually have a norm induced by the inner product if we're in an inner product space. An inner product space is said to be complete if Cauchy sequences converge. We've probably in the past talked at some length about completeness. How you're going to approach completeness? Well, in the real numbers, not like this, probably. Um, in the real numbers, you use the ordering, the greater than, less than ideas. But you ain't got greater than or less than in an inner product space. You ain't got greater than or less than even in the complex numbers. So how to deal with completeness? Of course, the idea, the informal idea of completeness just between you and me is we, we want a continuum. Like the rational numbers are not a continuum because I got a bunch of holes in them. The real numbers are a continuum because they're complete is the punchline. So this idea of completeness ensures we're in a space that doesn't have any holes. Well, if you're going to go around trying to take limits and stuff, you better make sure you're not in a space that's got a bunch of holes in it. I can take a Cauchy sequence of rational numbers that does not converge to a rational number. So if my point set is rational numbers and I put a metric on that, I got Cauchy sequences that don't converge. Yeah, because you got holes in the space. So this idea of requiring Cauchy sequences to converge that is this idea of completeness as, as we have defined it really is to ensure the space doesn't have holes in it. And so you can do, you can take limits and talk about limits of Cauchy sequences. Of course you can, that's a definition. So there's the formal definition. The informal idea is complete spaces are, are a continuum. They don't have holes in them informally again. And finally, a definition of Hilbert space, a complete inner product space is a Hilbert space. That is a Hilbert space is an inner product space in which Cauchy sequences converge. We've looked at Bonnock spaces in the past. Um, the Bonnock spaces are um, complete normed linear spaces. All right, well, then a Hilbert space, you have an inner product which induces a norm. So Hilbert spaces are special cases of Bonnock spaces. They got more structure. They are Bonnock spaces. So anything you can do in a Bonnock space, you can do in a Hilbert space because Hilbert spaces are Bonnock spaces. But you can do more in a Hilbert space. There you have an inner product. So there you can talk about orthogonality. Uh, you can talk about projections. You can do the Gram-Schmidt process. Inner products let you do lots of stuff. So that's why Hilbert spaces are my favorite spaces of all. Uh, you wouldn't talk like this in finite dimensions, but the real numbers and the complex numbers, they're complete. So is Rn and Cn. So these are technically, these are examples of Hilbert spaces. They're trivial Hilbert spaces or uninteresting Hilbert spaces. The interesting Hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional, but these are examples of Hilbert spaces as well. We are quite familiar 
with the structure of Rn and Cn because of, uh, say, linear algebra. You know how linear transformations work. You can represent a linear transformation from Rn to Rm with a matrix. Yeah, if we play our cards right, we can do that in Hilbert spaces as well. We'll need a few extra conditions. But just as we have a fundamental theorem of finite dimensional vector spaces that says, for example, if we have an n-dimensional real vector space, then it's isomorphic to Rn, similarly for Cn. If we have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, then I can tell you what it's isomorphic to with a few layers of details thrown in, not just any Hilbert space. We'll put some more properties on them. But there's these extra nice Hilbert spaces for which we can totally classify such infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces in something I will call the fundamental theorem of infinite dimensional vector spaces. It's a long story with lots of details, but in functional analysis, we'll have the equipment to explain it. So we'll get into that uh, in a couple of sections in these particular notes. So we'll turn our attention um, to Hilbert spaces now, infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. In the next section, we'll look at the L the space L2 briefly, and then we'll get into uh, the details on what I mean by the fundamental theorem of infinite dimensional vector spaces and all those layers of details that are necessary to get that to hold. Have a nice day. Uh, I'll see you in the uh, L2 section here in a little while.